I live not for myself, I must concede A million miles an hour, my mind exceeds Calculating the inner workings of the system Deleted, the conceded, let me list them The search for immortality is vanity, sanity is plain and simple yet complex Our thoughts on our own, my mind reflex Let me know we've been hexed even before we were born Our innocence torn, our souls worn a degree of false evolution Against nature's constitution, therefore I struggle to find a solution A revolution? But I quickly grow weak as I start to peak and must conclude and plug the leak to focus on being alive. Breaking from the battle I stride to focus on the things that drive me in the first place. Tranquility with the agility to recognize the facility that surrounds the feeling of life that be like the simplistic being of a tree. The life that pulsates from inside you, inside me. So excuse me if I get pissed at their rationalizations of their manifested nations that forsakes all creations. We cannot change the station while they finish their masturbation of the world. Throughout history, there's always been the bad guys. The ones you will see and hear about in this new show are the ones that are guilty of some of the world's worst crimes. Crimes against humanity, kidnapping, attempted kidnapping, murder, war crimes, and economic assassination to name a few. These criminals have never been prosecuted or even brought to trial. You have seen them in the political spotlight as well as in international business circles. They have shaped the world you see. They have fed off of and or created the tragedies that you've only read about, if not experienced. Their reason isn't about money. It's about power and control with no regards to human life. To them, their end justifies their means. These are the bad guys. Kissinger was born Heinz Alfred Kissinger in Germany, May 27, 1923. His father, Louis Kissinger, was a school teacher. His mother, Paula Stern Kissinger, was a homemaker. Kissinger had a younger brother, Walter Kissinger. In 1938, fleeing Nazi persecution, his family moved to New York. After high school, he studied accounting at City College in New York. In 1943, he was drafted into the United States Army. He went through basic training at Camp Croft in Spartanburg, South Carolina, was naturalized, and sent to study engineering at Lafayette College, Pennsylvania. The engineering program was later canceled, and Kissinger was reassigned to the 84th Infantry Division, where he met fellow immigrant Fritz Kramer, who arranged for him to be assigned to military intelligence. In 1944, he went to Germany in the Counterintelligence Corps. After his service, he went to Harvard, where he received his bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D., In his writings while in Harvard, he expressed interest in Otto von Bismarck, who gained a reputation as a royalist and reactionary politician with a gift for stinging rhetoric. He openly advocated the idea that the monarch had a divine right to rule. His work brought him to the attention of Nelson Rockefeller. He began working with the Rockefeller Group. Kissinger later became the advisor to Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York, who sought the Republican nomination for the presidency in 1960, 1964, and 1968. In 1968, Kissinger had become an advisor to the Johnson administration after visiting Vietnam three times. He had also become involved in the peace talks in Paris. He shared this information with Richard Nixon, who was running against Herbert Humphrey in the presidential election. He told him that the Johnson administration was close to an agreement with the North Vietnamese, which was being kept secret from the South until it was finalized. At the end of October, Kissinger called to tell the Nixon campaign that there had been a breakthrough in the peace talks. The bombing of North Vietnam stopped, and the final talks were to begin, which gave Humphrey a last-minute surge in the polls. A few days before the election, President Thieu of South Vietnam refused to join the negotiation as advised by the Nixon people who said, hold on, we're going to win. These people are proceeding on the assumption that folks close to you tell them to do nothing till January the 20th. Now, 
We I think... Know, I know who they're talking about, too. Is it John Tower? <laughs> well, he's one of several. Miss Chenault is very much in there. Well, she's very close to John. And uh, the, uh, the embassy is telling the president, and the president is acting on this advice. He started doing it uh, uh, back about the 18th, following our talk on the conversation on the 16th. The peace talks collapsed and Nixon went on to win. Nixon wasted no time making Kissinger a national security advisor and later secretary of state. Less than a month after Nixon took office, him and Kissinger drew up plans to bomb North Vietnam sanctuaries in neutral Cambodia, which was against the U.S. Constitution because the bombing of Cambodia was an act of war which needed approval by the U.S. Congress. Kissinger also approved a plan to conceal bombing missions from military records. Under Kissinger's supervision, pilots flew over 3,600 secret missions over Cambodia, dropping 110,000 tons of bombs. The bombing was soon picked up by the press and Kissinger admittedly got the FBI to use wiretaps to find the leak. He wiretapped his staff as well as reporters. He began meeting secretly with the North Vietnamese negotiator Lao Duc Tho, which were kept secret from the U.S. government. Even the Secretary of Defense didn't know anything about the meetings. Meanwhile, Prince Chinook was soon toppled by a CIA-sponsored coup in Cambodia. Kissinger denied CIA involvement in the coup. Kissinger threw support to coup leader Long Nau, who attacked the North Vietnamese immediately. Kissinger implemented the decision to invade Cambodia, which drew resignations from the members of the NSC staff. In 1973, Kissinger was jointly awarded with Le Duc Tho the Nobel Peace Prize for ending the war in Vietnam. Le Duc Tho refused the award because there was no peace in Vietnam. The war continued. The U.S. also continued to bomb Cambodia, which illegally was directed by Kissinger. A few years earlier, major corporations were worried about Salvador Allende, who was running for president of Chile, nationalizing their copper industry and conveyed their concerns to Nixon. Allende won. During the period Allende was waiting to be confirmed by the Chilean Congress, in a meeting with Nixon, Kissinger said, I don't see why we should stand by and watch a country go communist do the irresponsibility of its people. In another meeting between Nixon, Kissinger, and the CIA director Helms, they wanted to come up with a plan so Allende would not come to power. In an internal CIA memo, it outlined Project Foo Belt, Track 2, the code name for secret CIA operations that were intended to undermine Salvador Allende's government and promote a military coup in Chile. This was directly under the supervision of Kissinger and kept concealed from the State Department and Defense, as well as the Embassy of Chile. Chile's General Snyder, a strong believer in their constitution, was a barrier for any type of military coup. Washington wanted him removed. The money was gathered and handled through CIA channels for weapons, tear gas, grenades, ammo, and payoffs. Kissinger later received word that Track 2 plotters had failed an attempted kidnapping of General Snyder. In a meeting with the CIA, he expressed concern if Track 2 could succeed at this time. The very next day, CIA sent a cable to Chile. It is firm and continuing policy that Allende be overthrown by a coup. It is imperative that these actions be implemented clandestinely and securely so that the United States government and American hand be well hidden. In the end, General Snyder was killed in a kidnapping attempt. The church committee was tasked with the investigation in which the CIA testified that Kissinger was informed of the operation every step of the way and even demanding updates. Allende did take office, but only briefly, as a military coup ended with his killing on September 11, 1973. Augusto Pinochet took power and a reign of terror ensued that would last 17 years. Then came Watergate. Nixon resigned instead of facing impeachment. Some of the articles of impeachment were the concealment of the bombings of Cambodia and Track 2. After Nixon's resignation, which led to the impeachment being dropped, any investigation into the secret bombings and Track 2 were stopped. Kissinger remained Secretary of State under Ford. In 1975, Kissinger and Ford thought it best for Indonesia to annex East Timor. Kissinger and Ford met with the Indonesian President Suharto and gave him the go-ahead for the invasion. The American weapons being sold to Indonesia at the time were for self-defense purposes only. The U.S. provided weapons, helicopters, uniforms, ammunition, food, and logistics. Over 100,000 Timorese were killed in the invasion. Kissinger had long denied discussing the invasion in the meeting with President Suharto. Declassified documents show that during the meeting, Suharto says to President Ford, I would like to speak to you, Mr. President, about another problem, Timor. 
We want your understanding if we deem it necessary to take rapid and drastic actions. Ford replies, we will understand and will not press you on the issue. We understand the problem you have and the intentions you have. Kissinger, you appreciate the use of U.S. made arms could create problems. It depends on how we construe it, whether it is in self-defense or as a foreign operation. It is important that whatever you do succeeds quickly. We would be able to influence the reaction in America if whatever happens, happens after we return. While he was on the plane headed back to the U.S. from the trip, the State Department cabled Kissinger twice, saying that the U.S. Congress would cut off military aid and weapons sales to Indonesia because clearly they were using them for offensive purposes. When Kissinger returns, he is angry. Kissinger messages the department, I want to raise a little bit of hell about the conduct in my absence. On the Timor thing that will leak in three months, and it will come out that Kissinger overruled his pristine bureaucrats and violated the law. How many people in L know about this? Arms sales continued after the short hiatus. In later meetings, one of Kissinger's aides confirms the normal relations with Indonesia had resumed. Not willingly, said Kissinger, illegally and beautifully. Kissinger left office when Jimmy Carter defeated Ford in the 1976 elections, but remained as an advisor for presidents to come. In 1982, Henry Kissinger founded Kissinger Associates, an international consulting firm. Although Kissinger is very secretive about his clients, some have surfaced throughout the years. One of his clients was BNL, an Italian bank whose Atlanta branch featured prominently in the BCCI and the U.S. Iraq weapons transfer scandals of the 1980s. Democratic Representative Henry Gonzalez of Texas stated the following on the floor of the House. Henry Kissinger was a paid member of the BNL Consulting Board for international policy. Mr. Kissinger held this position during the height of the biggest banking scandal of its its time, $4 billion in unreported loans to Iraq by the Atlanta branch of BNL. Mr. Kissinger resigned from BNL on February 22, 1991, just days before the Justice Department announced a 347 count indictment against BNL. Some of Kissinger Associates' prominent cronies have been Paul Bremer, former Iraq Director of Reconstruction. Nelson Cunningham, manager partner of Kissinger and McLarthy, Richard W. Fisher, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, Timothy Geithner, the United States Secretary of Treasury, Jamie Miskett, deputy director for Intelligence, Central Intelligence Agency, Bill Richardson, former senior manager director, former U.S. diplomat, Jay Stapleton Roy, vice chairman, senior U.S. diplomat, Brent Scowcroft, former United States National Security Advisor, Kissinger has also belonged to the Bohemian Club, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Aspen Institute, and the Bilderberg Group. He is also an honorary Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire. In conclusion, Henry Kissinger is guilty by his own admission or by the documentation contained of crimes against humanity, war crimes, conspiracy, attempted kidnapping, murder, breaching his oath of office, treason, and the list goes on and on. Henry Kissinger worked his way into political power and through his context built his legacy on the graves of innocent people. No one can even guess the number of dead from his political and business moves. His disregard for life and pursuit of power has earned him a seat at the table of the bad guys. Spignu Brzezinski was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1928. His family, members of nobility, bore the Trabicote arms and hailed from Galatia. Brzezinski's father was Thaddeus Brzezinski, a Polish diplomat who was posted to Germany from 1931 to 1935. After attending prep school in Montreal, Brzezinski entered McGill University in 1945 to obtain both his bachelor's and master's degrees. His master's thesis focused on the various nationalities within the Soviet Union. Brzezinski then went on to attend Harvard University to work on his Ph.D. focusing on the Soviet Union and the relations between the October Revolution, Vladimir Lenin's state, and the actions of Joseph Stalin. He received his doctorate in 1953 and became a United States citizen in 1958. In 1959, he moved to New York City to teach at Columbia University, where he wrote The Soviet Bloc, Unity and Conflict, he also became a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York and attended meetings at the Bilderberg Group. During the 1960 U.S. presidential elections, Brzezinski was the advisor to John F. Kennedy's campaign. 
and in 1964, Brzezinski supported Lyndon Johnson's presidential campaign. He also supported the Vietnam War, which led to the deaths of 58,148 Americans and over a million Vietnamese. From 1966 to 1968, he served as a member of the Policy Planning Council of the U.S. Department of State. For the 1968 U.S. presidential campaign, Brzezinski was chairman of the Herbert Humphrey Foreign Policy Task Force. In 1969, while at Columbia University, he wrote a book called Between Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era that was published in 1970. In his book, he predicted a more controlled and directed society would gradually appear, linked to technology. This society would be dominated by an elite group which impresses voters by allegedly superior scientific know-how. Unhindered by the restraints and traditional liberal values, this elite would not hesitate to achieve its political ends by using the latest modern techniques for influencing public behavior and keeping society under close surveillance and control. Technical and scientific momentum would then feed on the situation it exploits. Upon reading the book, David Rockefeller lured Brzezinski away from Columbia University to become a chairman and co-founder of the Trilateral Commission in 1973. Brzezinski selected Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter as a member. Jimmy Carter announced his candidacy for the 1976 presidential campaign to a skeptical media and proclaimed himself an eager student of Brzezinski. Brzezinski became Carter's principal foreign policy advisor by the late 1975. After his victory in 1976, Carter made Brzezinski National Security Advisor. In 1977, Brzezinski forms the Nationalities Working Group dedicated to the idea of weakening the Soviet Union by inflaming its ethnic tensions. The Islamic populations are regarded as prime targets. In December 1978, Brzezinski says, an arc of crisis stretches along the shores of the Indian Ocean, where fragile social and political structures in the region of vital importance to us threaten with fragmentation. The resulting political chaos could well be filled by elements hostile to our values and sympathetic to our adversaries. State Department official Henry Pretch will later recall that Brzezinski had the idea that Islamic forces could be used against the Soviet Union. In February 1979, after the Shah is disposed of in Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini takes over as its new leader. The U.S. is interested in continuing the work with the Iranian government. At first, the U.S. is taken aback by the new fundamentalist Islamic government, and Brzezinski contemplates forming a military coup. But Khomeini is fiercely anti-communist, and Brzezinski soon decides that Iran's new government can become a part of an effective anti-Soviet alliance he calls the Ark of Crisis. Nine months later, on November 4, 1979, a group of Islamist students and militants took over the American embassy where 53 Americans were held hostage for 444 days until January 20, 1981, in support of the Iranian Revolution. In 1980, Brzezinski planned the Operation Eagle Claw, what was meant to free the hostages in Iran using a newly created Delta Force. The mission was a failure and caused the deaths of eight American servicemen. On December 8, 1979, a little over a month after the Iranian hostage crisis began, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. The Russians were initially invited by the Afghan government to deal with the rising instability and army mutinies, and they started crossing the border on December 8. But on December 26, Russian troops stormed the presidential palace, killed the country's leader, believing that he had secret contacts with the U.S. Embassy and was probably a U.S. agent. Operation Cyclone was the code name for the United States Central Intelligence Agency's program to arm, train, and finance the Afghan Mujahideen during the Soviet War in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989. Operation Cyclone was one of the longest and most expensive covert CIA operations ever undertaken. Funding began with 20 to 30 million dollars per year in 1980 and rose to 630 million per year in 1987. Mosques back again. Because your cause is right and God is on your side. After the 1989 Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, the United States attempted to buy back Raytheon Stinger missiles. With a $55 million program to buy back around 300 missiles, the U.S. government collected most of the Stingers it had delivered. But some had found their way into Iran, Korda, and North Korea. As for the insurgents and their leaders like Osama bin Laden, they became what we know today as Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. In the 180, 
In a January 1998 interview, Brzezinski admits that it was the U.S. policy to support radical Islamists to undermine Russia. He admits that the U.S. covert action drew Russia into starting the Afghan war in 1979. Asked if he has regrets about this, he responds, Regret what? That secret operation was an excellent idea. It had the effect of drawing the Russians into the Afghan trap, and you want me to regret it? The day that the Soviets officially crossed the border, I wrote to President Carter, We now have the opportunity of giving the USSR its Vietnam War. Then he is asked if he regrets having given arms and advice to the future terrorists. And he responds, What is most important to the history of the world? The Taliban? or the collapse of the Soviet Empire, some stirred up Muslims, or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War. In the present, is Big New Brzezinski is the chairman for the RAND Corporation's Center for Middle Eastern Policy Advisory Board, counselor and trustee for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, as well as a counselor and trustee for the Center for a New American Security. He is also top advisor to Barack Obama. In conclusion, Brzezinski has used an indirect approach doctrine to commit his crimes and is guilty by his own admission or by the documentation contained of crimes against humanity, war crimes, conspiracy, breaching his oath of office, and the list goes on and on. set up by the party was something huge, terrible, and glittering. A world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons. A nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans. Perpetually working, fighting, triumphing, persecuting. 300 million people, all with the same face. Tell the difference, tell the difference, tell the difference, tell the difference. This part of the documentary requires that you grab a piece of paper and something to write with. After each of the following examples, you will either write A for Republican, B for Democrat, or C for none of the above. At the end, I'll give you the answers and you can see how you score. Well, they have a right to support who they want. That's the American way. Absolutely. But I'm just not for him. So, I mean, who are you supporting in this next uh, election? Why don't you shove it up your ass, lady? Why don't you shove it up your ass, lady? Anybody who's against our commander-in-chief should honestly be, like, sent out of the country and, like, put in Iraq and Afghanistan and, like, blown up. How can you post these things? Blank is our president. You should respect him either way. I say Blank isn't the bad person. You are. Think about it. It's a typical Obama election. The man can't do anything honest. Are you, uh, are you at all worried about him giving amnesty to the illegals? Uh, I believe when he gets in office, due to the fact that he has a military record, I understand what it takes to protect the country. He do a secure outpost if people do what's necessary. You don't want to get your message out? No! Why don't you shut up your ass, lady? 
keep that down because anybody who's against our commander in chief should honestly be like sent out of the country and like put in Iraq and Afghanistan and Afghanistan and like blown up. Why are you supporting uh, Senator McCain if you're a Democrat? Yeah, sure I do. That's when she was a Goldwater girl. She's a beautiful she, that's when that's when she was a Goldwater girl. <laughs> she is. She's actually and she gave a great speech last night. You like Michael Moore, you hate the American flag, you hate what America represents. Ron Paul is for our liberties, he's for our democracy, Ron Paul will bring the troops home. I want to say one thing. We are and always will be a new world order. I'm going to say this again. A new world order. Justice is over. Peace is over. This is an historic moment. The haves and the have mores of the power in our world. I want you to listen to me. When we are successful, and we will be. People have got to know. It's been a long time coming. No. Disorder. No. Conspiracy. No. Freedom. If you act recklessly, you will pay a heavy price. Staying on that path will only lead to airstrikes, waterboarding, war. Mass murder, unspeakable atrocities. The mightiest of financial firms. The elite. That no nation can stand against. We'll take over our way of life, our world. Thank you. Good night. And bless this new world order. Change the channel and it's Debunk This, Season 2. A show for debunkers to do their thing as well as for the choir to have a reference point. Now so many people find it hard to believe that we're being poisoned, tested on, lied to, that plans are documented to control and contain us as well as kill us by the powers that be. That indeed conspiracies exist and not that everyone who speaks of this is a nut job or else you're going to have to call yourself a nut job because whether it's O.J. Simpson, Michael Jackson, 9-11, everyone speaks of conspiracies. Everybody's got one. And this show isn't about why they do what they do. It's about the fact that it has and is being done, therefore exists. Now, this show won't be covering an hours worth of evidence. We'll focus on an element or two, keep it simple, and to the point. And all links will be provided in the video description below. Now, every time the term New World Order is brought up, the deniers and debunkers just go off the hook saying, you people are crazy. There's no such thing as the New World Order. Where do you people come up with this garbage from? Now, I've been listening to this argument for years and years now, and both sides of the fence on this issue get pretty extreme. I mean, we have to first off start with the terminology, New World Order, which comes from New Order, a new system, regime, or government, a new economic order. You know, Hitler's plan reorganization of Europe under Nazi rule was a new order. You know, this is an abstract concept that has been around for a long time, which means it's existing in thought or as an idea, but not having a physical or concrete existence. You know, abstract concepts such as, you know, love or beauty, you know, which can be defined in many different ways depending on who's doing the defining. Denoting an idea, quality, or state rather than a concrete object. Abstract words like truth or equality. Now, the New World Order isn't the boys club. I mean, there's no t-shirts and hats and got a clubhouse with the NWO logo on the facade but rather an abstract concept. So now that we understand a little bit better about the new, what the New World Order is, let's take a look at some of its history so that the deniers and debunkers know where we come up with this crazy notion from. We can start off by just going through some old newspaper articles from the New York Times. New World Order sought by Newton D. Baker, Secretary of War in the cabinet of President Wilson in 1926. 
H.G. Wells is proposing a new world order in 1939. A new world order is pledged to the Jews in 1940. Wang Penang declares China will march to, say it with me, new world order with Japan, Germany, and Italy. I mean, and there's countless articles out there that we could go through. I mean, look them up for yourself. We can go to the Council of Foreign Relations uh, website and look at the think tank research project that was uh, done by uh, Michael Mendenbaum, uh, Christian Herter, who's a professor, Paul H. Newts from School of Advanced International Studies, the John Hopkins University. They did a study group on, say it with me, the New World Order from July 1st, 2000 to June 30th, 2004. We can also look at U.S. Patent Number 6112188 for the privatization of the marketplace states in its background of the invention that among the many tasks necessary to create a successful new world order, after the events of the past several years in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, it will be necessary to transform ownership rights in substantial portions of some countries' vast state-owned capital stock into private hands. Do we need to go any further? All right, let's just play some gold and oldies but goodies. We have a real chance at this new world order. New world order. A new world order. They're talking about a new world order. To build a new world order. The new world order. Order. The New World Order. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney has approved a revised draft of a policy document on the New World Order. The New World Order is emerging. New World Order. Barack Obama is in for a New World Order. And the President outlined his vision of a New World Order. It's a New World Order. Now we've been through the terminology. Uh, we've been through um, newspaper articles referencing it for years. Um, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Think Tank Study Group. Uh, U.S. patent and video directly from the elite. I mean, so at the end of the day, by all the evidence provided, the, say it with me, New World Order has and does exist. Now debunk that. Citizens of the world. It is time. For another message from the New World Order. First thing. People have got to know. There's no, no reason to uh, soft pedal it. Anymore. <laughs> you. You have no choice. The fact is, you fear us. You need us. Bitterness will take time to erase. Anyone? Disorder must be punished. We will also destroy anyone who may have a vendetta. It's a serious situation. It's our law. What should I do? When you ask. I'm here to tell you. To resume cooperation. Go back to work. Continue. Consuming things. Do uh, what the new world order tells you to do. Thank you. But it's not enough. It's not enough. But it's not enough. Not enough.
Change the channel, and this is Debunk This, a show for debunkers to do their thing, as well as for the choir to have a reference point. So many people find it hard to believe that we're being poisoned, tested on, lied to, their plans are documented, control, and contain us, as well as kill us by the powers that be. That indeed conspiracies do exist, and not everyone who speaks of it is a nut job, or else you're gonna have to call yourself a nut job. I mean, whether it's O.J. Simpson, or Michael Jackson, or 9-11, whatever it is, everyone speaks of conspiracies. This show isn't about why they do what they do, it's about the fact that it has and is being done, therefore exists. Now this show won't be covering an hours worth of evidence. We'll focus on an element or two and keep it simple and to the point. And all links will be provided in the video description down here. Now this episode's topic, I was skeptical myself, okay? Only because I lacked any knowledge of the issue on, on chemtrails. Um, now with all the things going on, it's hard to research everything. And, and this one, it's, I didn't really have an opinion on it other than like, yeah, it's possible with these fools, you know? I mean, because they do things like this all the time and have done it. So anyhow, after my last tour around the country last year, the end of the year, and witnessing these trails in the sky more than any time I can ever remember. And I've been around the country nine times. I mean, it was very distinct. All these gridded patterns in the sky that just seem to melt together, creating cloud formations that uncover the entire sky from horizon to horizon. I knew at this time that, you know, I had to look into this a little deeper because it, it's something that's just not normal. And now I know I've heard all you debunkers talking about how chemtrails have already been debunked. Man, that's the same crap you cat said about FEMA camps. So, you know, your opinions have no weight in my book and because you don't even know what you're talking about. So anyway, I started researching it and I came across, you know, geoengineering. Now I'm going to bring this up, not as anything to debunk, but just to give you an idea of what they're talking about. Now I found out that they're talking about doing this. That there, there's even patents out there that you know of, of how to do this. Now they're not admitting that they're doing it at the present, but that they want to do it to combat global warming by laying grids out in the sky that combine to make cloud formations that blocks the sun's rays. Now that sounds exactly like what I witnessed and what I saw and what you see in videos of people showing videos that claim to be chemtrails. Now I'm just, just bringing this up, I'm not going to go too much into geoengineering as to prove my point that they exist, but it's just to show a similarity here. You look for yourself into the sky and you watch this and see if it matches up with what they want to do and what you see in the sky. That's all I'm saying about this. So debunkers don't get your all panties in a bundle over this because this is, this is not what I'm using to prove that they exist. I'm just saying, observe yourself, take a look. It might make you think and it might make you dig a little deeper. And the next thing that I came across in my research, it blew me away. It blew me up from the Library of Congress. I mean, here it is in plain text from the 107th Congress, first session, bill text HR 2977, Space Prevention Act of 2001, which was introduced by Dennis Kucinich. In number two is section 7B. They're calling for the banning of chemtrails. Say it again, the banning of chemtrails. And this bill, of course, was not passed. And you know, well, change the channel that doesn't mean they exist you debunkers might say okay all right then well if you won't take the word of a congressman to heart and feel that they're just a bunch of ten four hat wearers as well would you take the word of the people who know the science and follow the sky on a daily basis that is not rain that is not snow believe it or not military aircraft flying through the region is dropping chaff small bits of aluminum sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, telesized paper products but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're up there practicing now they won't confirm that but i was in the marine corps for many years and i'll tell you right now that's what it is what happens here military jets 
jets don't come out of Key West Air Force Base and they move off into the atmosphere and they drop mylar strips. Some could be a little wider, some are small glass fibers that are coated in aluminum. And what the Air Force does is they take their military jets and they dump these out of the aircraft, they fall into the atmosphere, and some take as much to a day to fall down. This is inevitably military or something going on. The government, the Air Force, you see this kind of a pattern like this. You can rest assured there's something going on. They're actually a little bitty magnetic, a little bitty strips of whether it's aluminum. I mean, there it is, plain as day. Again, right there, plain as day. Now, as far as the existence of chemtrails, it's very apparent that they do exist. So stop saying they don't. I'm not, I'm not saying that everything out there that's in the skies, chemtrails, but we got to start with the fact that they do exist and then go from there. I don't need to go any further with any more evidence. The elements I just went over are enough. I mean, whether it's from the military, the government, geoengineering, covert operators, or whoever else. It is happening. It has been going on. People can debate all day about why. But there is no debate about if. Now debunk that. I'm changed the channel and this is Debunk This. A show for debunkers and deniers to do their thing. As well as for the choir to have some reference points. So many people find it hard to believe that we're being poisoned tested on, lied to, the plans are documented to control and contain us as well as kill us by the powers that be. That there are such things as the new world order, chemtrails, weather warfare, mind control, withheld medicines and technologies, that indeed conspiracies exist and not that everyone who speaks of it is a nut job or you're going to have to call yourself a nut job because whether it's OJ Simpson, Michael Jackson or 9-11, everyone speaks to conspiracies no matter which side of the fence you reside. This show isn't going to be about why they do what they do. It's going to be about the fact that it has and is being done, therefore exists, plain and simple. This won't be a show covering hours worth of evidence. We'll focus on a few elements and keep it simple and to the point so that there is no confusion. All links will be provided in the video description and I strongly suggest before saying there's nothing to debunk as your only line of defense that it's better to remain silent and thought of food and open one's mouth and remove all doubt. In short, look at what's being presented, click the links, and if the information is incorrect, present your evidence to counter and debunk this. Let's start off with the terminology of what we're going to be talking about. Weather modification. Modification is the action of modifying something. In this case, it would be the weather. Weather weapon. A weapon is a thing designed or used for inflicting bodily harm or physical damage. Figuratively, it's a means of gaining an advantage or defending oneself in a conflict or contest. Weather warfare. Warfare is an engagement in or the activities involved in war or conflict. Weather modification, weather weapons, and weather warfare is nothing new for people who have kept up with history. These things are openly admitted by the powers that be as well as denied at other times. Even though these things are easily proven, some people deny extremists refuse to even take a look at the proof and think that anyone who brings it up is a space cadet. Oh great, another brilliant idea from the peanut gallery. Guys, why can't you find something productive to do? Sheesh. I honestly believe these idiots want us to believe that they have such powers to control nature like that. That's called Mother Nature, you freaking paranoid buffoon. LMAO. You can't control weather. This is funny. Being an Air Force weatherman, this is BS. LMAO. <laughs> I was experimenting with vibrations. I had one of my machines going and I wanted to see if I could get it in tune with the vibrations of the building. I put it up notch after notch. Suddenly, all the heavy machinery in the place was flying around. I grabbed a hammer and broke the machine. Outside in the streets, there was pandemonium. The police and ambulance arrived. We told the police it must have been an earthquake. I told my assistants to say nothing. Yes, I saw the Mythbusters the episode on, on this where they supposedly busted the myth by building a couple of machines, of course not exactly by the patent, and they didn't work. Now another guest on the show built one of the machines and produced a rhythmic vibration over 100 feet from its location resembling a semi-truck that was going by constantly. Nevertheless, they say they disproved the myth. 
Now, Tesla's original earthquake machine, as it was dubbed, was made over 100 years ago. 100 years ago. And that's why I'm bringing it up. It's something to keep in mind for the rest of this episode. Project Cyrus, 1947, was the first attempt to modify a hurricane. It was a collaboration of the General Electric Corporation, the U.S. Army Signal Corps, the Office of Naval Research, and the U.S. Air Force. An airplane flew along the rain bands of a hurricane and dropped nearly 36 kilograms of crushed dry ice into the clouds. The crew reported, pronounced modifications of the cloud deck seeded. Next, the hurricane changed direction to make landfall near Savannah, Georgia. The public blamed the seeding and claimed that the reversal had been caused by human intervention. Operation Cumulus was a project of the UK government in the 1950s, which was investigating weather manipulation in particularly through sea cloud experiments. The project was operational between 1949 and 1952. The military were controlling the weather for several reasons. As detailed in the minutes of the Air Ministry meeting held on the 3rd of November 1953, they included bogging down enemy movement, incrementing the water flow in rivers and streams to hinder or stop enemy crossings, clearing fog from airfields, Project Prime Argus was a series of nuclear weapons tests at high altitude to create an artificial radiation belt in Earth's atmosphere. This went on from August and September 1958. The first seeding experiment since the Cyrus disaster in the U.S. was attempted on September 16, 1961 into Hurricane Esther by the NHRP and the United States Navy aircraft. Eight cylinders of silver iodide were dropped into Esther's eye wall and winds were recorded as weakening by 10%. The seedings into Hurricane Esther led to the establishment of Project Storm Fury in 1962. Operation Popeye, Project Popeye, Multiple Intermediary Compatriot, was a U.S. military cloud seeding operation running from March 20, 1967 until July 5, 1972, during the Vietnam War to extend the monsoon season over Laos, specifically areas of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The operation seeded clouds with silver iodide, resulting in the targeted area seeing an extension of the monsoon period an average of 30 to 45 days. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had been wishing for quite some time in terms of years, that they had some way of, of slowing the truck down in Vietnam. That led me to advise the Joint Chiefs of Staff that we had a potential weapon system. And so I was, uh, I was asked to uh, start to put together a top secret operation to go to, to Vietnam to see if we couldn't make it rain more over there as a, as a military operation. All the roads over there were uh, dirt roads, and uh, when it rained, it caused them a lot of problems. So that during the monsoon season, there was so much rain and water in the roads that uh, the trucks really couldn't move very freely. Our mission was to make it rain. In a DOD news briefing, the Secretary of Defense states on April 28, 1997 that others are engaging even in an eco-type of terrorism whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. So there are plenty of ingenious minds out there that are working, finding ways in which that they can wreak terror upon other nations. It's real, and that's the reason why we have to intensify our efforts, and that's why this is so important. Now, the UK and the US isn't the only countries out there that have been working on this. We've seen in the news about Russia, and as well as China. Now, I know that people would like for me to go into heart or would like me to go over the endless patents regarding this, but I'm not. I think at this point we can conclude by what's already been presented that A, 
whether modification exists. B. Whether weapons exist. C. Whether warfare exists. I'm an old Southern boy, and uh, I just don't know if I can see a black man making a change. Uh, the only black man I've ever seen with change is he's had a cup in his hand. That's right. You racist, and you know you are. Oh, you're a racist. It's not the oh, racist. Why does that matter? Racist? Okay. I got the N-word, I've become a Muslim, I've been uh, you know, called a un-American. I'm worried, but these people, the, the tension's getting thicker and thicker. When people like that, it's, it's starting to scare me. Uh, what about what? Be specific. Be specific. I'm afraid some of these people might try to hurt my mama. Get rid of them. I've had a number of people in the weekends in the White House. Strangers tell me. You're racist. You're racist. There it is, right above the McCain Palin sign, a makeshift ghost hanging from a noose. A Barack Obama sign attached upside down, Obama's middle name, Hussein, spray painted and misspelled above. Mike Lunsford hung the ghost in his yard. He spoke to us off camera saying his views could hurt his employer's business. But he also says, make no mistake, he doesn't want an African American running the country. I want to sound racist here, but I do not want a black man running my country. It doesn't matter what color or your nationality is. It's all about change. The Chinese motherfucker coming over here selling liquor in the hood. The Chinese motherfucker coming over here selling liquor in the hood. We got Arab coming over here. We got Arab coming over here. Who you know, said that they won't swim another 9-11? It doesn't matter what color or your nationality is. It's all about change. A cartoon featuring a picture of Democratic presidential candidate Barack Obama on a $10 food stamp, surrounded by a bucket of chicken, Kool-Aid, ribs, and watermelon. Why is it not racist? Because you're taking it as racist. We didn't. It's a watermelon, a bucket of chicken? So what? Those are African-American stereotypes. Really? Who says that? You? So what does the chicken and the watermelon and the ribs mean then? Oh, what does the spaghetti and meatballs mean? It's racist, racist. Why, you Why don't you go in there and tell Obama that? He's supporting La Raza. Wow, you're so tall. It means the race. Because I'm a man. You got your beaner, got your beaner, beaner, desgraciado, traidor. Change the channel, and this is a message to the choir. If you're not part of the choir, then this is not for you. I feel that it is necessary to speak directly to you, the choir, as you are the ones who see, feel, and know there's a battle going on. That same battle that has been going on long before any of us were ever here. We progress in this struggle as the years go by, but are always hindered by the same tactic. For sitting way back in the shadow, lurking, are the real puppet masters, jingling the strings of the masses, and although we don't like to admit it, which is our main weakness, even our very own, divide and conquer. They are jingling those strings at this very moment. Can you feel it? Oh, you'll see it down in the comments section. Divide and conquer. They start revolutions and control both sides because they already foresaw it coming. They've already planned for it. Control both teams wins every time. Divide and conquer. And it's not really that hard to see. I believe that it is the job and purpose of the choir to acknowledge that we are control to even go against our own people within our own belief structures, our choir, our tribe, our community, our family, and even ourselves. Once we can do that, we can restructure. We can recode. Breaking the bondage that they have placed upon us, and it will spread. 
figuring out the exact grip that they have on us, breaking it and moving forward with that knowledge. Understanding their tactics and carrying them is imperative in our struggle. They are already C50 moves ahead in any direction. They cover way more angles by far than we do. We are way behind. We are losing with the mindset that we're not. We must always examine the past to know where we are at the present. It is the only way to work towards the future. But with all that in mind, I do not believe that it is too late. I do not believe that we have lost. I believe in an individual irreplaceable being that has never been here before and never will be again in this capacity. The more the mind is free, the more that that part of ourselves is revealed. We cannot and will not ever really move forward until we can do this. To sum it up simplistically, we have to crawl before we walk. We have to see before we can be. The time of the novice era is over. It is time to see where we are and then move forward. I'm Change the Channel. It's been a message to the choir. I'll catch y'all next time, and I'm out. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the dangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This is the entrance to Warehouse America. It's not the real name, but there's enough haters here already, so we'll just leave it at that. I mean, it all started with 10 people from all over the world looking for a crib to do our art, music, party, and network. We had a six month lease and a sound system and a school bus in the backyard to travel in. Five years later, we've had thousands of heads come through with 30 heads living here on the steady. In the backyard, Looks like a damn trailer court there's so many buses back there. We've had every type of person known to man come through here. We've had rednecks to thugs, hippies to anarchists, poor to rich from Cairns, to not even giving up about anything. Activists to anti-activists, patriots to communists, hip-hop to bluegrass, jug bands to speed core. Everything you can think of. Every religion to every sexual preference. Dogs, cats, rats, roaches, raccoons, owls, hawks, snakes, from landslides to earthquakes, you name it. And as you can imagine, it gets pretty grimy here at times. Battles for control, head hunting parties, backstabbing to money grabbing 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Me and my dog Star, we've been here the whole time and seen it all. It's changed a lot since the beginning. But don't get me wrong now, there's, there's a lot of cool shit that still comes out of here. You got the art, the music, and like this for instance. This is an electronics area where radio transmitters are built and made for pirate radio stations. And most of the buses in the back, they run on vegetable oil, which means you can travel for almost free. We have a rainwater system which cuts down on our water bill. And these things like this is what has compelled me to do this series. I also did the series to, to teach myself some video editing and skills also. 
It's basically a group fog of what we do and what we have done. From love to war, it's all here on Warehouse America. Reporting that the Iraqi people want this war. Is this true? No, no, that's not true. No, no, that's not. The New York Times is reporting that the Iraqi people want this war. We don't want this war. We want peace. Of course they don't want war. They are peace-loving men. But the New York Times report. Yeah. That the Iraqi people want the war. And Are they really? Are they insane? Are they insane? Let them go and look to the hospital and see the cancerous diseases and all these things. Yeah. My, uh, my niece died uh, three months ago, my little niece. She was born with so many diseases and died 40 days after, uh, after, uh, after, after her mother, after the phone. Oh yes, me, myself. So how many, how many, how many uh, cases I have at home? Three diabetic, my mother, my father, my little brother. So many cancers, so many diseases, so many things. Who wants war, for God's sake? Who wants war? Nobody. Just uh, Mr. Bosch wants the war and Mr. Tony Blair. I don't know why they want to have the oil. We can make contracts, we can make so many deals so they can get the oil, but uh, killing people, distracting people, forgetting something, why? How do you feel about the war in Iraq, the pending war? Well, we will defend about ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Are you scared at all of the war to come? Huh? Well, yeah, yes, I am afraid. <laughs> and, and how old are you? I'm right. Ten years. Ten years, yeah. Is there anything that you would like to say to the people that say the Iraqi people want this war? did not want the war. They want peace. And we always say for all of the world, we want peace. We love the American people. Yeah. Thank you. They want, they want peace, they want uh, not war. They, they, the Iraqi people want war because uh, you are supposed to wait the uh, American soldiers as liberators, as uh, in Italy in the... Liberator, liberators, liberators from what? They suppose. What? Are, are we being enslaved or something like that? Liberators from what? For God's sake, we live in freely. We love our leadership. What? We choose. We choose in our leadership. Why? Nobody. Nobody targets a, a bullet in our hand. Do you know anybody in Iraq who is for the war? Nobody wants this war. All of Iraqi people want peace. Nobody, I think, I think uh, Iraqis uh, are the last people who think of war. They are peace-loving men and women. Actually, we hate war and we, uh, we don't want war about our country. We live in peace and we want peace, just peace. Thank you. We want freedom and eating and peace. And peace. 
the peace. We want the peace. Only peace. Now, Iraq wasn't the first time a few of us have resisted for something we feel strongly about. This is Shoshone Land in Nevada, a Bechtel nuclear test site. A couple of busloads of cats went down to New Orleans after the hurricane to do some relief work. They brought tools, they brought food, power radio transmitters, and they also used the vegetable powered buses to transport people and supplies. I know the music is illusion, but the movement is real. I got a mud hut in heaven and a mansion in hell. I've killed so many rappers over tracks of self coffins. Turn Wanda in, get the sky drunk off it. Come on. Just the young scholar, just the young scholar, just the young scholar when I'm married, man. They cook meals. They also help rebuild. What if, what if Hitler was a wizard of the Rothschild Jews? If Jesus wasn't pale and his eyes wasn't blue? If Darwin died saying what he thought wasn't true? The Oklahoma Center and the Trade Center too was all lies. What if half the things that you thought that you knew or everything on the news was a joke on you? Like what if killing Kennedy was really a coup? What if Illuminati ran things? What if they still do? What if the Bush family let the drugs come through? What if the CIA had a hand in it too? The more cops added, then the more crime grew? And 13 families ran the world to its doom? What if paper money was a scam on the people? What if your skin color made them treat you unequal? What if AIDS was made and there really was an evil that taught you love your enemies and hate your heroes? What if there was no what ifs and no fools and MK Ultra was a mind control tool? What if the poles shifted? What if there were floods? What if half the presidents were related by blood? Life is everywhere, so what if aliens were real? And not just one kind, but all types were here. What if they blew the levees to make people move? and let FEMA fail, now they can send troops. What if 9-11 was an inside move so they could switch the constitution and change up the rules? What if people worship Satan and kidnap kids, that's sick. What if I told you half them people were rich? What if the feds killed Tupac cause he had love and could start a revolution that was led by thugs and they shot B.I.G. just to cover it up? What if this whole generation was following us? What if there were no what ifs and no fools and you research the things I said and they're true? Instead of getting mad at Azim and his songs, why don't you look it up? I bet you you'll be singing along. What if there were no what ifs and no fools and you research the things I said and they're true? Huh? What if you researched and studied till dawn? I bet you, when I'm finished, you'll be singing along. It's a simple thing. You could have rhyme and not do it. Such a simple thing. That you could see and not do it. It's a simple thing. That you could try and not do it. Simple. You know, that's what you do. You keep it basic. You just get right to the sermon. You don't play around with these people. You get right to point A, point B, point your sir. Accept it.
the show where I'll share what it takes and how it really is to live off the grid. Um, each episode will cover different aspects of life and basic survival. So let's get started. I came up here um, off and on for about six years. And um, I've been living up here for about three quarters of a year, almost a year, coming up in January to be a year. And, um, but I've been coming up here, I spend a week here, a couple weeks there, a month here, you know, throughout the years. But when I first, when I first came out here, there was, it was absolutely nothing. There was, there was nothing out here and it's way back here too. And um, the only thing that was out here is a, a, a little shade structure, really old, um, a, a little tiny little building, a little tiny building here, old, old one, and then the, this old car. It's just right in the middle of this. I don't even know how in the world they got this car down here. <laughs> Reese Rick, he's been living up here for about five years, and I believe his wife's been up here for about almost the same amount of time, maybe four years, something like that. I mean, when I say it's back here, I mean, it, it is. It is back here. I mean, I grew up half my life in the city and the other half living in the country, but, I mean, this is way back there. I mean, it's, it, to walk out of here would take you all, a whole day. The, I guess the closest... Uh, civilization would be across the lake. There's things off the grid that you need to survive. You know, the basic necessities like food, water, shelter. If you want electricity, you gotta figure out how to conserve your trash. Communications, knowing your environment, any kind of comforts, you know, that you want, like uh, build you a nice shower house. You also got to know first aid, educate yourself, you know, even just starting out. Um, a fire, you know, if you're in a fire zone where there's a lot of fires during the summertime and stuff like that, you got to have your escape route and everything. You planning it all out from day one. Anywho, i am changed the channel. This has been Off The Grid, which um, each episode is going to cover aspects of living off the grid. Anyway, I wish the best for you and yours, and I'm out. This is Off The Grid 2. Now this show is about one group's experience living off the grid. Um, some people say, you're not off the grid, change the channel, you're on YouTube. Now this show won't be about defining the term. The term off the grid is defined by people differently, but I can't say from my year experience up here, it's always been a work in progress. Now at the present, we got three people, five dogs and one cat and 14 chickens, and I've been off the grid for 336 days and counting. One of the first things that I had to learn about when I came up here was energy. I mean, you know, uh, the system of power and everything, um, and basic energy conservation. After living in San Francisco in the Bay Area for the last decade, you know, this took some adjusting. Now, I've been coming up here, you know, for years before I moved up here and everything. And um, back then, gee, we don't have, we didn't have the juice that we have today. I first came up here, um, I came up in uh, my truck with pulling a camper and I had an inverter attached to the battery of the truck which provided electricity for uh, AC electricity uh, and I used that when I needed to use power tools like drills and stuff. I used also DC electricity, 12 volts at the time with one automotive battery. Um, and what I powered with that mostly was my shortwave radio. Uh, it has the option to power on DC. The way I charge the battery, of course, like I just didn't sit here with running the truck to charge the battery, that's really like waste of a gas or diesel fuel or in this case vegetable oil. But anyway, it's a waste. And so what I would do is every time I go to town, I would charge the battery in the truck. And then uh, by the time I got back from town, because it's like one hour and a half uh, with that big truck, 
uh, just to get to the main road. So minimum going to town, even if I did, you know, didn't do anything at all, was like three hours. So I charged the battery, and then with that battery charged, I could listen to the radio, the shortwave radio, or sometimes I'd play my iPod onto an old set of computer speakers that I rewired. After that, I bought a uh, generator, uh, an old um, a Lister copy generator. Uh, the idea was to run it on vegetable oil. Um, it's huge, 28 horsepower. It weighs about a ton, literally. The engine is about 2,000 pounds. The generator head itself is almost 1,000 pounds. And it generates uh, 24 kilowatts, no more than that. Anyway, way more than I would ever want to use. And I ran it, built it. It took about well over a year to build it because I had to build a building to put it in first. Uh, uh, and then so I got this huge generator and I buried um, underground uh, cable from the generator running 220 from the generator house, which is also the tool shed, to what we call uptown, which is where we are now, and uh, to downtown, which is down the hill. We also have the suburbs, which is up. Anyway, it's already got 220, um, 100 amp service. The, uh, we have so much electricity here that we actually have to use it. It also runs on vegetable oil. The generator, the 2800, 28 uh, kilowatt generator uh, running on vegetable oil. So run now four hours, take about two gallons of vegetable oil and um, all the power that we can ever possibly use. good place for dogs that have no place in the city. And they have uh, something to do up here. They have a job, which is healthy for dogs' uh, emotional stability, is to have a feel like they're needed. Just a few seconds ago, the 3600 RPM gasoline generator from um, Home Depot was running. And that is the backup generator for the big diesel generator that runs on vegetable oil, which is currently not running, which is why we're running a backup generator. Um, what happened was the Lister engine uh, had a problem and ended up twisting off the, uh, the uh, camshaft and it broke about like a year ago and I haven't fixed it. So anyway, get the generator fixed right away or come up with an alternate solution at which time I decided to get some solar panels. So I got three solar panels producing in reality about 400 watts, 400 to 500 on a nice sunny day. Um, and uh, they go to a charge controller which goes to a set of 48 volt batteries that I got at Sam's Club, golf cart get batteries. And I've been growing the system, you know. Then later on I got a good inverter, not one of these cheap Craig and Auto supply inverters. Now they work okay for running your coffee grinder or something like that, um, but they really don't work for other stuff and they're not very efficient. So I finally got a good Outback, is a brand name, uh, inverter, sine wave inverter, pure sine wave, has a charger built in so that when I'm running the generator I'm also charging the battery, which is very useful too. Because then you can take maximum use of the generator uh, while you're running it to charge the battery, you're not completely dependent on the solar panels. That's right, different types of light bulbs make a huge difference. Um, 40 watt fluorescent lights. Right now I've got, when I turn on all the lights we have in the studio with the exception of the film light, um, it runs 10 watts outside, 5 watts there, 10 watts there, what did I just say, about 25 watts total. So in the future actually, on that light note, I want to put a wind generator up <clears throat> because very often on days that it's not sunny, like when it's raining, it is windy and so we still get electricity. Um, and also I need to fix the grease generator um, 
and that's so I don't have to run the uh, backup generator which runs on gasoline. In the future I do want to experiment with other concepts but I have no idea what I come up with because that's what research is all about. You know you work towards something and you might end up someplace else. <laughs> Thank you. 